Can you hear me all right? There we go. I think you can hear it now. Um, hi, and welcome to our panel on user experiences, uh, customer insights about beyond visual line of sight. So we're going to hear from some people, not necessarily the just the manufacturers, but people who are using these systems, uh, try to get some sense of the experiences they've had and uh, what lessons they've learned and where we can kind of take things from here. So I'll, I'll go from, from that site down to here. Uh, Matt Scacero from the University of Maryland test site, and they've done a, a number of beyond visual line of sight flights, uh, including over the Chesapeake Bay and in Belize. We've got uh, Craig Marcinkowski, uh, Director of Strategy and Business Development for Griffin, Griffin Sensors, and they have a booth here on the floor and some really interesting technology that you should check out. And we have Karen Jackson, the Secretary of Technology from the Commonwealth of Virginia. She's been working for years to get more unmanned systems in the state, and her boss is going to put in a bid for all of us to move there uh, when you hear him talk tomorrow. And some of us work there anyway, so. Good. <laughs> uh, Nick Flom, he's the Director of EOS Safety at the Northern Plains EOS Test Site up in North Dakota, and if you've been reading the walls in the restroom all week, you, you know that they are experienced with beyond line of sight flight. <laughs> and Todd Gretz, the uh, US, UAS Program Director for BNSF Railway. I thought it was just somewhat ironic that a, a railway company is helping lead the way to open the skies. So what I thought we'd like to do, um, I guess we can just go this order again, if they could do a quick little introduction, give you an update on the kind of things they've been doing, and then we'll start with, um, we have a couple of topics to start off with, and then we'd love to open it up to the floor. So, Matt. Good, thank you. So, University of Maryland, U.S. test site, uh, we partner with anybody, everybody, industry, government, academia. Uh, we bring a research background from the university, but it's really about the teams we put together. So, we've had very good experiences. A lot of the beyond visual line of sight work that we've done, uh, Belize, Chesapeake Bay, others, uh, some of it has been true beyond visual line of sight, others has been more technically beyond visual line of sight, even beyond line of sight, uh, and knowing the difference between the two. Uh, and really a lot of it's been education in our industry amongst the people that we work with and the relationships. Uh, so each project we learn something new technically, but even more so we're learning more behavioral approaches, regulatory approaches, and working outside the United States has been uh, hugely beneficial to see different approaches, different ways of doing things, uh, and trying to bring that back. We all know working with the FAA can be challenging, that's our opinion. Um, but, but they're good because they're good. Uh, the, the way they approach that safety case approach, the risk analysis approach, so we try to educate and work within that structure, but also educate the process uh, and keep moving the needle forward. Hi, uh, Craig Marcinkowski from Griffin Sensors. Uh, happy to be here today. Um, we make uh, systems that detect and track um, low-flying aircraft. Um, our parent company, SRC, has been doing uh, counter-UAS work for the military for the past decade and also has been helping the Army to integrate their own um, unmanned systems in the National Airspace System without a chase plane um, using ground radar as a primary sensor um, to meet the scene avoid requirement. So we formed Griffin Sensors three years ago to address very similar markets, drone security, and low altitude UAS traffic management um, tied in with what NASA has been doing um, you know, in the commercial spaces. Um, we do have a booth here um, with some of our radars and uh, spectrum sensing equipment on display. Um, we've been involved in a couple of Pathfinder programs with the FAA, um, helping support BNSF um, with ground radar, helping them uh, fly beyond visual line of sight. We've also been participating in the CRADA for uh, drone detection uh, surveillance capabilities around airports. We just wrapped up here a couple of weeks ago at DFW Airport. Uh, we were one of four companies evaluated. We were the, the last company. Um, FAA is putting the report together and they'll be publishing something, uh, I believe, around the October time frame. And um, the last project that I think is of interest and note for Beyond Visual Line of Sight Flying, we've been one of the um, lead entities as part of uh, Project USAFE, uh, stands for UAS Secure Autonomous Flight Environment. It's a safe UAS integration program in the state of New York, um, funded by the governor's office um, at $250 million over the next five years. Uh, partnered with NASA, the FAA, and, and a bunch of other collaborators to build and deploy a 50-mile UTM corridor. Um, that'll be complete by the end of 2018. And um, also another NASA-founded concept, New Star, which stands for National UAS Standardized Testing and Rating. Um, it's almost like an underwriter's labs for drones testing facility. Um, that's underway as well and be completed in 2019. So just a quick background. Um, so you heard a little bit about the Commonwealth 
during the introductions, um, we've been pushing very hard with the Mid-Atlantic Aviation Partnership, which is one of the six FAA test sites, to identify areas in the Commonwealth that are predominantly best suited for BBLOS type testing. We have a corridor in the middle of the state that's about 3,000 square miles um, that's flush with rail beds and utility lines and pipelines for people to actually go out and be able to, to try some of this um, some of these activities with a mobile BBLOS piece of equipment that we have through the test site. Um, predominantly, the work that we've been doing is around utility line inspections, um, and we recognize that we, we need to, to keep the policy environment in check with the technical environment so that we can all move into this much more quickly. We're very interested in getting out of the, the visual side of this. We did the first package delivery in Wise County a couple of years ago. We had the honor of, of doing that. And, the line of sight requirements that were that were required at that point are still required. Um, if you ever wanted to see how those can impede a process, um, when you're working in the mountains, you're working across multiple county lines to really try to be able to, to get out of that framework and into something that is, is less restrictive, um, is we knew then that's what, that was a place that we wanted to push, that was a place that we wanted to go. And since then we've been doing just that. So through through acquisitions of the equipment as well as, um, you know, from a policy environment, trying to push this as, as quickly as we can. And I'll second Matt's comment, we will work with anybody. Um, so we are open for business, obviously we're a neighbor of, um, of Maryland, but we feel like one of the unique pieces of, of the attributes of Virginia that we have is we have, at, at, we have openings for air, land, and sea. So we have the ability to do multimodal testing and especially when we get into to the beyond visual line of sight, that's going to be an area that we feel is going to be a sweet spot for the Commonwealth. Um, I'm uh, Nicholas Flom. I'm the uh, executive director for the Northern Plains UAS test site, uh, one of the designated test sites from the FAA. And you know, we're, we're in a position that we're, we're here to support industry. Um, early on, we recognize that you know beyond visual line of sight is. Uh, Something that needs to be tackled. We put in place, you know, a way to emulate, you know, low altitude with, you know, daisy chain and visual observers, and that's a start. But we want to continue to expand that. This past December, we got approval for uh, higher altitude uh, beyond visual line of sight um, approval. Uh, we have a unique situation in North Dakota. I have a, uh, a UAS business park that uh, has a joint use agreement. Uh, with the Grand Forks Air Force Base that has uh, a capability to have a long runway with, uh, and at that business park was a, a partner, uh, uh, General Atomics, who had a need. They uh, have a flight training academy. Um, when they're leaving the airspace, going into civil airspace, they're using a chase aircraft. How can I remove the chase aircraft from their operations? Uh, we had existing infrastructure at the airport uh, with a uh, DASR-11 radar that we were able to uh, use as part of our safety case to uh, get the approval for the uh, detect and avoid uh, side of everything. And we have a, as a tester, we have a great relationship with the FAA and we're able to work through a process that uh, was able, from their standpoint, get a repeatable process for accepting uh, beyond visual line of sight uh, type of approvals. And I think we'll be able to discuss that a little bit later. But we have uh, approvals in place that uh, we can execute uh, these types of operations in North Dakota. So I'm Todd Gratz. I am uh, the uh, director of, uh, of the uh, technology services and infrastructure at BNSF Railway and I have the opportunity to uh, direct our, uh, our entry into the unmanned aerial system space and as your comment earlier, surprising a railroad's getting into aviation. It's just getting back to our roots because at one point we had airlines, at one point we had passenger rail, and in, in many cases we're a, you know an earlier uh, an earlier innovator of a wide range of technologies. Um, so uh, this is one of many technologies that we're exploring uh, to supplement uh, what we are doing from a uh, from a safety standpoint. Uh, it's an additive. It's 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 what we do at the railroad. We if we identify a, a process, a procedure, or a technology that will help uh, create a safer environment. Uh, uh, and enable our employees to uh, have a better uh, workplace and, a, and, a, and you know, better quality of life on, at the job site, you know, we're going to invest in it. And we, uh, we believe that the, uh, the unmanned aircraft are a part of that, and we're very proud of that. Um, you know, aside from the obvious use cases of rotorcraft and things that we can do with bridges and tunnels and all the other fun things we have like yards, 
Uh, when you have 20,000 miles of track in 28 states and two Canadian provinces, you need something that can inspect and scale. And so we have a uh, kind of a, a, a multi-altitude vision of where we might be long term, but in the short term, we've been proudly partnered uh, with our friends at the FAA uh, as, as their chosen uh, research partner for uh, long range beyond visual line of sight flying. And you know, we're proud to say that after the program kicked off in late uh, 2014 and 2015, we, uh, we started the first lower, uh, I'm sorry, the first uh, long range beyond visual line of sight flights in the lower 48 United States on a multi hundred mile uh, section of our track. 2016, we followed that up with the capability of daily, regular, uh, railroad specific aircraft, railroad specific sensors and systems to fly hundreds of miles again over our track. Uh, there was no uh, visual observers involved, no chase planes, it's, it's, it's pure play uh, beyond visual line of sight. Uh, and then this year, uh, working with our research partners at the FAA, not only are we building on that ecosystem of, of systems, whether it was Griffin Radar uh, or, uh, or Harris Systems, uh, Rockwell Systems, all the fun best and breed things that we've assembled, we're building on that in, in uh, 2017 to also add in uh, larger aircraft and uh, a much more refined uh, airborne sense and avoid capabilities and other uh, command and control uh, technology to further provide our research partner, the FAA, with data that would support you know, ultimate rulemaking. We're aligned with really everybody in this industry and in understanding that uh, long range beyond visual line of sight flying, whether it be for uh, package transport or uh, for linear asset safety or what have you, uh, it's in the national interest to, to figure this out, have it done here, um, have that FAA uh, gold standard seal of approval on uh, what is done and uh, set the model for uh, the rest of the world. We're proud to be part of the community. Great, so I will pitch the first question back to you. I, I'm not necessarily gonna go back and forth, but I'll start with you and then anybody can chime in. So what's the main thing that you've learned from your experience and was it something maybe that surprised you or that you expected? Uh, what, what did you take away or what have you taken away so far? The flying is the easy part. That's the surprising thing. The flying is the easy part. Uh, uh, the, the fact that you can put something into the air and run it for a long, long period of time outside of the rigorous uh, risk uh, analysis and risk mitigation you have to put into place, uh, the flying thing is, is just to start. Uh, it's all of the support systems, uh, whether it's the command and control <coughs> systems or the data transmission or the analytics uh, or the processes and procedures and human factors and operating conditions and everything else that's required to operate this in scale. You know, we have several thousand more miles identified that we'd like to expand our research on. And, and what we've learned thus far uh, is gonna make that so much easier. But what we, the glaring thing was is, is that uh, there is so much more to large scale use of unmanned systems than the flying object. Yeah, I think to stop with uh, Todd said, the, the flying part is easy, especially if you're really focused on what we're focused on right now, small UAS, and a lot of us in the industry and the community really are focusing on small UAS because it's where we're at regulatory-wise uh, and things like that. But it's when we start focusing on what we're, where we need to go, exactly what you mentioned, Todd, about the larger aircraft. When you look at large aircraft, the safety case there, the risk-based analysis of flying over people, large aircraft, higher risk levels, it gets us into areas that are much more difficult. The technology is actually probably there now or will be there very shortly, but it's setting the standards. And that's what we're working with the FAA and the STM and the Special Committee 228 and all those on, is setting those standards. The technology will answer it really quickly, but nobody's set those standards yet. So I think that's what a lot of some of the test sites are really looking to do is move the needle, push the boundaries of those uh, standards so we can go out and start flying them now and to show this is where the real problem is and this is what the, you know, things like redundancy, SATCOM, uh, network control, all those kind of things. Uh, we're doing bits and pieces. I know that Virginia just sees SATCOM and there's, uh, everybody jumps on Iridium. Iridium is good for some uses, but not for everything. And then you get into spectrum, cost, bandwidth, all those other issues. That's where we really need to be focusing, not on the smalls, which are important to get done and use now, but we really need to be pushing the needle hard on the larger, riskier, more advanced use cases. Just to add a little bit to that, in terms of the test sites, I think that's why the test sites were put in place. Um, and we need to, to have that relationship. Obviously, we have a great relationship with the FAA and have done great things, but I think to really lean in on where we need to go and, and how we need to get there, the test sites should be the place where we're able to exper experiment and we're, we're able to test those things and help with the development of those standards 
And so we would like to, you know, obviously see the FAA lean in on the test sites more. Um, it, that's that's why we're there. And so in Virginia, we, you know, we constantly ask and constantly push, as does Matt and everybody else up here. But I think if we're gonna ha if we're gonna do this safely, if we're gonna develop all of those things that have to be the wraparound in order for these systems to be used commonly and safely, then the test sites need to be an integral part of that conversation as we move forward. Yeah, and as far as um, a challenge, I mean, we could talk, I'll talk from the um, perspective of the, the crater we just wrapped up, um, you know, at least testing down at DFW for, for airport security. And um, I wouldn't necessarily say it's challenges, just, you know, it's the time that things take. You know, this evaluation um, process is going on for about a year. Um, you know, if you look at all the companies that are being evaluated, they'll put a report together and then they're going to, you know, move down the next stage of, um, you know, what a program may look like or how that gets rolled out across the country. So um, it's, it's exciting to see all the progress we're making, but then you look out and you say, we, we have a ways to go as well. But, you know, it's nice to see, you know, all the progress that is being made with the Pathfinder programs, work at the test site and others. And I think the big thing is getting out and doing things, collecting data, making thing ha things happen. I know that's happening at the test sites, you know, out of North Dakota with the BVOS flying you're going to be doing. What, what BNSF's been doing, you have to get out there and do it. You know, one of the initial challenges that, that we, uh, we looked at and faced is, you know, where do you start? You know, when, when I'm going in for an approval for Beyond Visualize Site, where do we even start the conversation? We, we know that uh, what's been told multiple times, you need to put together a, you know, a safety assessment. Safety assessment, you know, risk assessment on what? Uh, what elements? And you know, we started out with a, uh, a concept of operations of you know, what is our flights going to look like? And uh, we presented it to the FAA. And uh, I think one of the um, major, uh, at our time, was a, a slight roadblock was within the agency. Who, who should look at this? W within the agency, who's responsible for making a, a decision in regards to uh, beyond visualized site approval? And started to find out there's a lot of people within the agency. And um, part of that was we, we put together, um, uh, working with uh, uh, Randy Willis, he put together a, a team that, I don't know the exact numbers, but I mean, it's multiple offices within the agency. It's, it's the air traffic organization, it's safety, it's uh, certification, um, the attorneys, you know, everyone uh, one way or another are involved. And uh, they now have a, because um, we were able to present them a concept of operations, we're able to give them something to review. Um, within the agency now, there's a group that's been established. There's roles and responsibilities uh, within all of those different offices to now evaluate that. So, you know, one of our initial challenges was where do you start? One of FAA's initial challenges is who's going to read this? And uh, we're making progress with that. Um, they have a repeatable process that uh, that they can use. Um, you know, part of our um, uh, additional challenges that, that we put together, you know, but with this concept of operations are, what are the different elements that we actually need to look at? Um, it was interesting, I was, uh, we have a, a technical interchange meeting of all, all of the test sites, and uh, um, Randy was able to present at that, and he, he, he gave a, a really unique thing. He goes, you notice, through my entire presentation, I never said, beyond visual line of sight. He said, giving you a waiver to 91.113. What he's really doing is he's given, you need to come up with a process. We've had processes in place for a waiver to 91.113. It's been called a ground-based visual observer. It's just, or a chase aircraft. These evolve in different types of mitigations in place. And we need to now put together for 91.113, what mitigation are we going to use? We happen to use a, a DASR 11 radar um, that's existing infrastructure within the ATC system uh, as part of our concept of operations. But then that opens up more questions. So there's your detect, we can see them. We have to avoid, okay? And then how much are we gonna avoid them by? What kind of separation standards are we gonna have? And then when we first detect them, how early do we need to detect them? So that we can avoid them and remain well clear so that we don't cause a any hazards to the airspace. Those are some of the challenges that, that we had to look at through our concept of operations um, in order to get you know, our approvals. Within the agency, you had air traffic organization. They have separation standards. 
aircraft certification, they have separation standards. And how are we blending all of those together? Those are some of the challenges, and I think that the more times that we work through this process, you know, if it's uh, uh, BNSF working through the process, if it's a test site working through the process, we start to, you know, get some of these um, elements of the safety case that can become repeatable and uh, recognizable to the FAA. We uh, touched on this topic yesterday. There was a, a discussion and quickly went to regulatory as well, and it was kind of the same thing. Industry saying, what do we need to do? And government saying, you know, what can you do? And we, what, we'd like to accommodate that as much as possible. Uh, by the way, if, I, I, I know, I think there's some FAA people here, but whoever wants to get up and ask a question, uh, I think the mic should be on. Uh, we were happy to have you jump in at any time. But let's go back to this question then. What, in your mind, would be the best way to proceed to, to get to this point where you know what's expected of you and, and what do you kind of need from government or, I guess, in government's case, industry uh, to move ahead? What's sort of your best case scenario? <coughs> I mean, it's, we, we have a, I think we're pretty fortunate in that the, the, at least from our use case uh, for, you know, linear asset type use case, uh, the, the guidance that we received from, uh, from the FAA has been pretty clear. Uh, and again, we're looking at this as, a, as a, still a, you know, a research partnership, so, so therefore we can set some pretty big goals. Uh, we know that end goal is, is integration uh, and at least giving them the fundamental tools to create rules that would support that. So in our case, um, what is needed is clear. It's, it's really, it's generating data um, that, that uh, for example, that prove that a, uh, a series of systems when assembled in a certain way with certain performance metrics, uh, which included licensed spectrum and a, and a wide range of sense uh, and avoid technologies, that, that can all be assembled in such a way uh, that gives the pilot the equivalent level of sense, which is perceived to be uh, the eyes in the cockpit, and, the, and not just the eyes in the cockpit, but the feeling of being on the aircraft, the human factors and the human emotions that occur that we had to test and, and, and research. And so we've been given the directive that, you know, provide this data, show that the system works, show how well it works, so show reliability, and then more importantly, do that over time. So the other thing is, um, this is still research and testing, but we are flying in volume. Uh, we, are, we have something in the air, uh, a fixed wing, most days uh, now of, of, of the week. And uh, in addition to all the other rotorcraft things we're doing around our network, uh, but gathering the data, gathering the information from the flight hours, mining that information with a usable tool, um, that's what's essentially been asked of us. Yeah, I'll kind of just continue on some of our, uh, our elements. Um, you know, there was we, we had a unique situation, uh, again, from a, um, that we put in as part of our, our, our operational risk assessment against our, our concept of operations. Um, what kind of population density did we have on the ground as we were doing our operations? What kind of traffic density did we have in the air? Uh, those were all key elements to um, uh, the safety case that we provided. What kind of system are we flying? Having to have a, um, from our standpoint, uh, we're a public aircraft operator. We, we self-certified the aircraft, but I still ended up showing a, a full up system safety analysis of the aircraft that we were flying. Um, the, all of these uh, incremental steps are um, a starting point so that we can turn this into routine operations so that we can start to get more information about, can I start flying in maybe low traffic density airspace initially? How do I turn that into higher density uh, traffic airspace. Um, so, you know, we have a starting point that we can work with and then, you know, building upon that is, uh, is helpful. We have, you know, the, the technology on um, the training that we have for our um, observers, uh, radar observers. What's that going to look like? Um, how is that going to increase over time? Uh, we have a, uh, another component to this is that we're uh, using a, an existing, um, visualization system by Harris Corporation to, to provide us uh, the information that they have so that we can uh, see the other air traffic out there. So a lot of the um, requirements out there, you know, kind of a, a starting small, uh, but we're looking at something that we can continue to expand on so that this can be um, used across the country. Just a couple of comments on it. I think that this is definitely one of those positions where the, the crawl, walk, walk, run philosophy is 
is where we're finding ourselves. Um, we'd all like to go to the to the run part right out of the gate, but we know that there's a lot of steps that we have to learn and, and become familiar with before we get there. Um, I think part of this is going to be collaboration. Um, we have NASA Langley that's in Virginia. We have NASA Goddard who also has a, a flight facility in Virginia. And really it's trying to, to harness everything that everybody else is learning so that if North Dakota or Maryland has already been through a process and found something that's replicable or, or repeatable, um, making sure that we all understand that and don't retread the same ground over and over again is going to be paramount. Otherwise, it's just going to be a, a constant reinvention of the same process. And so I think we need to get through, as we, as we start to put frameworks together, as we all start to work in this space, there's got to be a way for us to not retread ground with the FAA, I'm sure the people from the FAA would, you know, be glad if they didn't see 25 of the same thing in 30 different formats. Um, you know, so, so the extent that we can all start to to come down to this on our own and to learn from each other before we get too far out and, and everybody has created processes that are unique to themselves, um, that's something that's going to, I think, expedite the process and hopefully provide a, a much more um, sane environment for everybody to work in and not just, not this haphazard of everybody trying to sort it out on their own. Totally agree, Karen, and, and Brett, to your point, you know, how, how does this work out perfectly? There's all this great work being done across the country and even internationally. How do we bring that together? Uh, one example through that, the USAID project in New York State, they're investing a lot of money. How does that get leveraged across the industry? This new star facility where they're gonna be performance benchmarking drones, it's roughly an $80 million facility. Um, how does everybody get to use that national asset and performance validate and, you know, and have a say in what that facility looks like at the end of the day? They're still taking inputs for what's the type of testing we need to do here. There's an advisory committee that will be announced relatively shortly here, all the different entities and, and groups that are taking part in that. So just one example, but it's getting everybody you know, coming together and, and leveraging the resources together. Okay. Um, I was going to jump back to an earlier question I was thinking about and then we got into some fun regulatory stuff but what are sort of the main benefits that you've seen uh, from your experience uh, we talk about typically assuming that things will be more efficient and cheaper is that the case or are those assumptions bearing out or are you learning some other things uh, or benefiting in different ways than you perhaps expected and I'll just throw it out to you I think the biggest one by far for us is and it it doesn't go directly against uh, some of the paradigms and some of the things that have been said, but it, it makes us change our focus. It really makes us think about the autonomous piece of autonomous aircraft. And a lot of what we think is autonomous isn't autonomous. It's automated, it's uh, mission planning, things like that. But true mm -hmm. autonomous, when you start thinking beyond, line of, uh, beyond visual line of sight, and especially beyond line of sight, it really makes you think about what are we really capable of. And it gets you out of the mindset of, okay, you have a human observer, you have human awareness, you have human visual systems, things like that. Okay, what happens if you have a more or less white sheet of paper and you don't start with that and you start with, I want to do that. I want to go over the horizon and do that. How do I do that with the machine, with the capabilities, with the processing power on the aircraft possibly, uh, uh, network systems, uh, satellite, I mean, all those pieces. If you start with that, the solution is probably going to look a lot different. So I think the one of the things that the jump piece, uh, the crawl, walk, run is really what we're doing and we've got to work through, especially regulatory, but some of those jump pieces of, if I want to do that and go 100, 1,000 miles away, which DOD is doing some of now, how do we take advantage of some of those lessons? That makes us think about it differently and spin the perception a little bit differently. And it makes us think about the technological and the regulatory pieces differently. And you know, what does air traffic control look like in that world versus this evolutionary, what's the revolutionary? So I think that's a benefit of pursuing beyond visual line of sight, beyond line of sight. I think, Matt, you, you pointed out one thing. I think the regulatory world is the crawl, walk, run, but the visionary world is doing exactly what you said. The key is how do you balance the two so that you find it's, it's the speed of innovation, and in our case, the speed of government. Um, innovation is moving at the speed of a bullet, and there's millions of things that people want to be able to do, and the technology can, in some cases, support it. In other cases, it's going to be able to support it. But then you look at the policy environment, and you look at the regulatory environment, and it's, you know, in, in some cases, laws and regulations and things were written in the, in the 1900, early 1900s or before. And so how do you, how do you 
fix that juxtaposition that you've got with that's the broad, I want to go there and I want to do that. I want to put a man on the moon kind of visionary piece in a regulatory environment that's very much oriented toward the crawl, walk, run. And so the balancing act is something that, you know, and unmanned systems is just one of the industries that's facing that cybersecurity and others are in a similar position. But we, we're at a, such a transformative period with technology that it's trying to find that balancing act so that, I mean, every experience that we have with the test site makes us want to do a little bit more. And it shows the possibility that we can do a little bit more. So the fire is there. I think everybody in this room has it. But it's how do you balance that far-reaching vision with a need to be safe and sound and do all the things that are right and not squelch the innovation um, that, that's required to have those big dreams. I think one of the simplest, from our standpoint, uh, challenges that we're trying to overcome is right now there's uh, operations that are being conducted with a chase aircraft as a mitigation. So we're sending up an unmanned airplane with a manned airplane that has a pilot and then that guy can't actually be a visual observer, so there's another guy in the airplane as the visual observer. And uh, you know what, what we're trying to accomplish is how do I remove that entire piece out of the equation. There's a reason why we want to fly on manned aircraft and let's take advantage of that. So, uh, I mean, the challenge would be, uh, I don't think that it's ever a long-term solution to have the manned airplane, you know, uh, being a wingman for a uh, uh, unmanned aircraft. So that's the challenge that we're trying to uh, remove. Yeah, I'll tell you one thing to add to that. So we removed that challenge in our case, you know, in 2014. So we got into 2015. The way we were able to do that, though, is that, lucky for us, we have a lot of support infrastructure. And so we were able to capitalize on critical elements of our, of our, of our infrastructure to support uh, the removal of uh, visual observers and chase planes and so on and so forth. So absent that, like absent having those systems, um, although I think uh, there are some of you guys are assembling them on the test side and others, you know, absent those systems, uh, we really, you know, we, we have to develop a set, a set of procedure systems and capabilities and, you know, measurement standards to know uh, that uh, can't, this is not a capability that's just for those with, a, you know, an embedded base of supporting infrastructure, that this is something that can be scaled. Oh, sorry, we have a question. Right. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, a lot of this, I'm Jeff Huggins with uh, Zodiac Aerospace. The, uh, a lot of the information that we're hearing is all about the CONOPS, and uh, my question is more about the airworthiness. That uh, uh, are there lessons learned or insights that uh, at the test sites with all your flying that you kind of figure out a technology path to either use some of the airworthiness certifications we use for manned aircraft or telemetry, or if there's another solution that uh, you see on the horizon. Thanks. So, uh, the University of Maryland, we uh, have a great partnership with the Naval Air Warfare Center Aircraft Division at Pax River. Uh, we actually took the Navy's uh, 1334 Charlie airworthiness and created an unmanned civil commercial airworthiness process with the DRL and the whole bit. Uh, it's much faster, much cheaper, much uh, more streamlined than the Navy's process. Uh, so as part of that, we are finding things like all basically all the things that are different than manner, the unmanned pieces, the data links, the uh, Air, uh, autopilots, but now that we're looking beyond visual line of sight, beyond line of sight, it's the SATCOM pieces, it's the network pieces that really nobody's dealt with, including in the military. Uh, 4G, 5G control, they haven't done that yet, other than in research projects. So pulling in those pieces that are different, we have to pull in a different way of testing them, and now, especially with the autonomous pieces, you're also figuring out, okay, how do you test non-deterministic systems? And there's a lot of different ways to do it, none of them are standardized or accepted yet, there's a lot of ways to do it, but that's the questions, like you said earlier, we have to ask those questions now, start finding some answers now, and deciding which ones are good answers, which ones aren't. So, yes, there's definitely an error in this piece. Again, not a lot of people are paying attention to it yet, because we're still talking about small and away from people and small risk case uh, things, but as we grow over people, larger systems, we have to go after this. So we operate as uh, public aircraft operators, uh, self-certify the equipment. Uh, with that, we we do aeronautical research. That's our uh, the uh, governmental purpose that we uh, that we're flying for. So when we're when we're doing these types of operations, um, they're not commercial operations. I think that that's an important standpoint. And the reason why people want to fly are 
research is great, but want to make money off of it. We want to turn this into a, uh, a commercial product. So there's just as much incentive from the manufacturer of the aircraft who wants to come and do this type of technology to bring, you know, that they have interest in the airworthiness process. Uh, they're leveraging the, um, uh, you know, the mobs of, of um, you know, SEG 28 that, that are coming down the line. Um, I provide an opportunity for them to test out that equipment. You know, uh, their airborne radars. If they want a, a place to do that and get operational experience, they can run, um, you know, our Beyond Visual Line of Sight uh, ground-based solution in the background so that they can uh, go towards that. That's actually gonna be probably one of the main reasons why somebody wants to fly using our capability is to assess the, the airworthiness of, of their aircraft or get operational experience with it so that they can turn it into a commercial product. Oh, question. Yes, sir. My name is Bob Johnson. Uh, Todd, if you could possibly shed just a little bit more light on BBLOS with the with the Class One railroads, how Pathfinder is sharing that experience, that information, with the Norfolk Southerns and the CSXs, and and they were looking toward you guys to to lead the challenge. Yeah, so it's it's common in the railway industry for one railroad to take, say, the lead on a certain technology, um, and, and it happens, and all the roads are part of this, right? Some of them lead in certain areas. We were fortunate enough to have uh, our leadership team have foresight to support this type of effort, this type of research, and and so we quickly got out in the forefront, and uh, we're in a, we, we share a great deal of, of our learning, uh, our findings, our information, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly that comes with doing this type of work. Uh, with the other railroads, not just the class ones, but short lines as well, uh, and that it, that has uh, spanned a whole wide, a whole range of things, such as um, sharing data, you know, uh, imagery, analytics outputs, um, you know, uh, findings on certain sensors versus others, airframes, and so on and so forth. It's been very collaborative, um, and I would think in the the longer term, not too distant future, but the long, you know, longer term you'll find that uh, um, a number of those railroads, when there are commercial operation capabilities, say for a beyond visual line of sight service, will likely adopt you know, similar systems and ways and means. So we've been very you know, inclusive, and, uh, and even this month we've got a number of sizable railroads visiting with us. So let's assume that someone out here wants to fly beyond line of sight. They're not sure how to get started, uh, obviously, they should come to North Dakota or Maryland or Virginia to get started. But beyond that, what sort of advice would you give them? Uh, what ducks do they need to get in a row and how should they proceed? Safety case. Uh, you have to think, that especially if it's a new uh, COA, a new uh, authorization you're looking for, uh, which for obviously for Beyond Visual Line said will be, you have to think about it the way the FAA thinks about it. A lot of our industry, a lot of our community comes at this from the, I'll say the shiny object uh, aspect. They're approaching it from the aircraft, the vehicle, uh, working up towards the hard stuff. The FAA and those of us from the manned aircraft world, it's a safety case. You have to build a safety case for whatever you're doing and it's case specific. So you have to be able to work, uh, understand what a safety case is made of, what are all the pieces that come into it, what are the addition, uh, existing research pieces that need to come into it. Uh, and build that safety case, have that awareness, that approach to it from the beginning will make your life much easier to actually get the authorization. If you start with, a, hey, I just want to go do this. As soon as you say the word just, stop right there. Because um, it's never just. Is that like watch this? Is that what see? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So you got to approach it from that mindset. Yeah, I'll even expand a little bit on, you know, the safety case. I mean, that's, you know, we have a, a two, two major documents that are associated with us, and um, that's, I'm guessing, uh, I haven't seen anything on Todd's, I'm sure he does too, a concept of operation and an operational risk assessment to go against it. Um, I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna tell you why it's okay that I, that I do it. And, you know, we started at the, um, so then the, the question, and we ask the FAA all the time, great, what do you want in the, what do you want in the con op? I mean, that's kind of like the, the, the Everyone's question. So, what do you want in it? And they go enough information that you know we're comfortable with the flight. It's like no, no, no. Like seriously, like what should my first paragraph be about? And uh, you know, the way that we approached it was um, start at the very beginning of the flight. Start start a week before the flight. 
And what does it look like? What is, you know, who's involved with it? Um, and we started, you know, kind of line by line going, um, I need to have a, uh, when our aircraft takes off, there's a visual observer. That's how, that's when the aer airplane goes uh, airborne initially, we have a visual observer. Okay, roles, responsibilities, requirements, training. Who is this person? What, what is he doing? We laid that out there. He has primary responsibility for the detect and avoid. Once he becomes radar contact, essentially, on our uh, visualization screen for the radar observer. Oh, radar observer. Roles, responsibility, training, requirements. We started going down that path, and we started laying that out. And went through the entire flight. Um, takeoff, uh, climb, cruise, descent, air traffic organization that you're working with communication protocols, uh, emergency situations that are associated with that. Um, when we started just kind of breaking it down from a beginning of flight to end of flight type of scenario. And, you know, associated with that, we have a, we're using a existing radar that that was not what its purpose was. Its purpose is to separate participating IFR traffic from participating IFR traffic at a given distance. It does not have that same type of requirement for separating IFR traffic from primary traffic or non-participating VFR traffic. There's different types. So we had to know what the equipment that we we're using and what was, what are its capabilities. And our concept of operation expands upon that. Um, you might feel like it's the, the, uh, the joking, like, you know, bring me a rock type of scenario, but you kind of learn a lot, you know, as you're um, dwelling down or whittling down to actually get that um, initial approval. It was interesting from, from our standpoint, you know, uh, separation standard from non-participating traffic to our own ship. What should it be? I really wanted the FAA to answer that for me. I'm comfortable with what, what you're comfortable with. If it needs to be, I need to be 10 miles away from non-participating primary traffic, I'll be 10 miles away, because at least I'm up in the air and this is a starting point. I already feel like I got low traffic density, that's a starting point. The air traffic, the certification guys, thought that was a great idea, because that's, you know, meets or exceeds what the uh, equipment has been used for in the past. Air traffic control says that is not how airplanes fly in the NAS. And so we have to start uh, coming closer to how do airplanes uh, fly in the NAS? What are normal types of operations? Because we don't want these to be uh, one-off scenarios. Um, so we, we kind of took a look at all of those different pieces and that's what we did for a concept of operation. And generally associated with that, that operational risk assessment became kind of easy, it kind of became, uh, well, in order to have a, a, a visual observer, this is the type of training that, that he should have. Well, that becomes part of your, your risk assessment. I don't have a guy who's never participated in this before being a part of our, our operations. It's somebody who has, you know, gone through some type of formalized training. And bringing that all together, uh, you know, that, that's, how we, that's how you start. And that's now something that, uh, the FAA is not going to say you need to include these 12 items, um, but think about you know what does the flight look like, and, and then that's how you can put it together. That was good. I mean, I think um, North Dakota and BNSF have really blazed the trail uh, for a lot of others who are going to be you know going down the same approval process. So I think you guys have done the whole industry a service there. Um, to your question, how how would we recommend somebody start? You know, working with um, working with the test sites. Another avenue is um, Project USAFE. Um, it's being funded 30 million next year out of the 250 million we talked about from the governor to complete a beyond visual line of sight corridor. And they're going to be validating seven different use cases for BVLOS. You know, with the you know leveraging all this work that's been done, working with Rob Pappas and Randy Willis's group who write those um, BVLOS safety cases and COAs. Um, so there'll be an opportunity, there'll be RFPs released probably in the summer time frame for each one of those seven use cases. So if there's a company out there that says, hey, we're looking to do linear inspection, we're looking to do delivery, we're looking to do precision ag, there may be a funded path for you to go and work on actually getting that BBLOS um, approval. Any other thoughts? 
<clears throat> okay, we're getting close to the end time, but I'd like to do a quick little lightning round question here. Uh, say five years from now, we're in a room like this, we're up on a panel, we're talking about this exact same issue. What are we saying? What's happened? <laughs> I'll jump in. You know, I think that it's routine and operations. We have some areas that this is, we've got procedures in place and it becomes routine operations. We're going to have, um, uh, Spectrum is always an issue from a, a secure network standpoint for the uh, CMPC. We're going to have maybe existing uh, FAA infrastructure, um, part of the equation that doesn't cover everywhere. We're going to be supplementing it with, you know, uh, other types of uh, technologies. If it's a uh, you know, Griffin sensor, uh, you know, along the way, providing some type of uh, gap fillers. And it's going to, I think it's going to be um, BNSF, uh, maybe not doing uh, utility infrastructure. They're going to have stuff that's going to take another, uh, maybe what we're doing, in another industry that hasn't even put in the approval yet. And we're all be working together and we're going to have a, a network out there that will be able to enable this in, on a much more routine basis. I would, I would say in five years, if we've done our job, it's, it's not only routine, as Nick says it, but it, uh, there's a body of data and a series of, of, of safety cases that have been proven to remove risk both from the national airspace and from, at least in our case, transportation. Uh, if, we can, if we can sit here in five years and say, look, because of all the investment and time that everyone in this room and everyone in this convention center, I don't know how many zillions of people are here, because of all the work that's been done, the money and investment, you know, we have reduced risk here, we've added this feature there, we've improved this economic indicator here, you know, then we've done our job. Yeah, I think our, our goal, at least on, on USAFE is, and you know, as we've laid it out with, with the FAA, NASA, and others, a fully autonomous flight environment, you, know, you have to define what that is, but multiple vehicles in the same airspace at the same time, flying autonomously beyond visual line of sight, potentially over people, uh, improving something is safe to get there. I would just put some ditto to what everybody else has said. Uh, the only caveat, while we're hugely optimistic, uh, and I think we will have that creative environment, that very much collaborative environment with everybody pulling together a body of data, uh, it'll be business as usual for some use cases, for some levels, at some sizes, in some areas. Uh, I, it won't be everybody doing everything anywhere they want yet, but we'll be well on our way. The best thing we can do to ensure that is to ensure is to make sure that we do it in a way that is safe, reliable, effective, efficient in using the safety case analysis methodologies of bringing in the air within its pieces and creating new air within its pieces that we need to in this world. If we leap too fast and regulatory illusion prevent us from doing that, but if we do and we create an incident, we create a path that is fraught with risk that nobody really paid attention to and we go down too far down the path and have incidents, it's going to set us all back, not only technically and regulatory, but public perception-wise. And that is a big piece. And you hear about uh, places you know, where they want to haul people around in quadcopters now. You do that wrong, and you're going to set all of us back for years. So we have to make sure that we approach it pro properly with the right mindsets. And so just um, as a closing comment, being the only one up here from state government, um, and you know, in five years, the hope would be that even even arcane institutions, in a lot of senses, like we're the we're the last adopters, um, and so to have these vehicles and these processes be a part of the government function, where we can use them and have them integrated into our fleet for for bridge inspections and for public safety, and to actually have them be part of our fabric. Um, if we can get there in five years, that will be a that will be a monumental accomplishment. Unfortunately, well, we've recorded this, so we can check. <laughs> See how we do. Uh, sorry, do you have a question? Yes, um, I've been to several panels, and every time Beyond Line of Sight comes up, it's a lot about operations, logistics. No one's really talking about the FCC. We need freaks. We need we need to be able to amplify freaks because right now everybody's using license free stuff. So, is this big big part of what you guys are doing is trying to get the FCC to get us allocated frequency for the UAS system? So I can add to one thing. There's a lot of what we use is license, but as I said earlier, you know that's a, there's there's a handful of companies out there that would have a you know a base of resources uh, that would include a license spectrum, um, and certainly you can always use more. But we we've been blessed to have it. So most of our critical communications are done over you know license protected, you know overlapping uh, coverage and systems. 
But um, I will say, and I, I don't want to speak for everybody here, but I know there are a number of, of vendors on the floor here that are also developing um, uh, both uh, type accepted and to be approved systems uh, in conjunction with different licensed uh, spectrum, uh, uh, both uh, terrestrial and, and space-based systems uh, that will likely ease a lot of the constraints and the concerns with using, you know, license-free 900, 2.4, you know, 5.8. Okay. Um, I was going to say, uh, we do have to that moves out of here, but if you want to come grab one of the speakers and continue the conversation, we do have the chat area just down the hall here. Hopefully they'd be, have some time and be able to do that if you need to. But uh, please join me in thanking our panelists.